Now let's talk about civilization and its discontents, our reading for this week. <clears throat> civilization and its discontents was written late in Freud's life. It's one of his last works, and in some ways it's um, one that kind of encapsulates nearly everything that he talks about. So it's a great work to read, and it's also something that is um, easily read, fortunately. Unlike Interpretation of Dreams, his magnum opus is very difficult to read. So, a late work of Freud, this little book was published in 1930. Freud wrote it in 1929, and it was an immediate success, unlike so many of his other books that he wrote. Indeed, his magnum opus, The Interpretation of Dreams, sold under 400 copies in six years. It was a total flop, and indeed, it was one of the reasons why he was often rejected and almost like a pariah in some medical circles. But Civilization is possibly Freud's best known work and most widely read work as well. Uh, Freud's disillusionment with civilization in this book hinges on his interpretation of human nature and its relationship to government, uh, especially the whole of civilization. Written between World War I and World War II, Freud feared uh, the dark side of human nature driven on by the death wish, by Thanatos, not just for the individual, but up on a social scale, a, the scale of civilization. Because, well, this is after World War I, and you, you're, you know 25 million people had died on the continent of Europe in World War I, and so there's still an ominous threat that's hanging over the land. In 1933, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Hitler would be elected uh, Chancellor of Germany. And so this, there was just an ominous foreboding threat that was hanging over Europe at this time. And Freud shares those fears, being a Jew. Uh, he's afraid of how civilization could melt down. And so individual human beings are driven on, he says, of course, by the two basic uh, and ineluctable drives of Eros and Thanatos, sex and aggression, but so are civilizations. Uh, without eros, civilizations don't go on to propagate and make babies and grow and, you know, have populations. Uh, but he also fears the other side of that, that, that equation, and that's the Thanatos side, and that is the aggressiveness of certain civilizations. And so you look throughout history and you've seen all kinds of conquests, barbaric ones, uh, where many, many people are butchered and slaughtered by one civilization uh, over another. So there's almost like a social psychology here. Th Eros drives a civilization on to reproduce and grow, but so does Thanatos, the other part of that id nature of the human being, up on a social level, up on a, uh, a civilization level, drives a civilization to also dominate and destroy others. War. Freud brings his wide-ranging studies of psychiatry, uh, history, mythology, and religion all together here to understand the whole scope of history and civilization. So there is a bit of a philosophy of history going on here, or rather we should say a psychology of history. But these two forces of our nature have to be subdued unto near extinction for an individual to live in higher civilizations. And the more advanced civilizations force uh, individuals to repress and vanquish these forces of the id even more. In other words, the higher and more loftier, the more advanced your civilization, the more the individual's id has to be contained and bottled up, okay? And so uh, you take, for example, the Roman civilization. Well the id still was able to come out and, and flourish at certain times, and it, the id could come out of the bottle, so to speak. But you get to a really high 20th century type of civilization like the Austrian Empire, well, the, or the Victorian England or something like that, and the id has to be contained more, okay? Thus, this leads us to, a, to become very unhappy people, even though we're in a highly civilized, uh, you know, world. And so, because we cannot allow the pleasure principle to flourish or to, you know, to relieve the pressures that it has. The pleasure principle driving the id clashes with the reality principle driving the superego. And so there is a kind of a Hegelian dialectic going on here, just like with Marx. We saw a Hegelian dialectic with class struggle. 
Here in Freud, we see Hegelian dialectic with psychic forces within the individual, okay? Between the pleasure principle and the reality principle, between uh, the individual id and the, the superego that enables us to become social creatures who get along with other people. So, there's a synthesis in the middle, and that's the ego that somehow or another balances these two and tries to come up with some way to, to manage them and to negotiate between them, find a compromise. Thus, an individual always feels guilty and still can't quite fulfill his desires. And so a malaise begins to set in in higher civilizations. Unhappiness reigns and the human condition uh, grows gray and grim. So Civilization, the book, uh, effectively summarizes a great deal of Freud's worldview on culture and psychology, even if it does leave out many of the details of his uh, life of pr prolific ideas and in other areas. It also kind of encapsulates encap uh, his other recent work at that time, The Future of an Illusion, which had been written about three years earlier. The Illusion and, and this book, The Future of Illusion, Illusion being religion. And so this kind of summarizes that as well. So reflecting on the malaise of the modern human experience, he sees the individual's happiness is sacrificed on the altar of public peace and prosperity. In the fifth chapter of Civilization and Discontents, Freud summarizes the, the main thesis of the book. He says, quote, if civilization imposes such great sacrifices not only on man's sexuality but on his aggressivity, we can understand better why it is hard for him to be happy in that civilization. In fact, primitive man was better off in knowing no restrictions of instinct. To counterbalance this, his prospects of enjoying his happiness for any length of time were very slender. Civilized man has exchanged a portion of his possibilities of happiness for a portion of security. And that is the main thesis of the, of the book. <clears throat> so the higher the civilization, the more ordered and more efficient that it is, the more exacerbated is this dialectic struggle that the, experience, uh, that the individual experiences. A quote often attributed to Freud says, the first person to hurl an insult instead of a spear was the founder of civilization. So at this moment, in theory, it was the beginning of a point in which human beings subdue their violence to maintain peace and thereby control their id. He said, quote, civilization is perpetually threatened with disintegration. Instinctual passions are stronger than reason. And civilization has to use its utmost efforts to, in order to set limits to man's aggressive instincts. So now let's turn and look at another of his great works called The Interpretation of Dreams. Again, this is probably his magnum opus, and this is really kind of the beginning of the whole psychoanalytic method. Um, interpretation of Dreams is a much longer work uh, than Civilization, <clears throat> and a uh, much earlier work as well, about 30 years earlier. It's very lengthy, it's very detailed and tedious, but I'm going to try to get you through at least the basic gist of the, of the work. Uh, Freud wrote prolifically on many topics, and he was capable of thinking across many disciplines. Uh, much of his interpretation of dreams builds on his work of five years earlier, published with Breuer, uh, known as Studies in Hysteria. He and Breuer noticed a patient, uh, or discovered a patient named Anna O, oh, who gave them a breakthrough moment that they needed to begin this new school of psychoanalytics. She had an aversion to drinking liquids, and through an extensive analysis, she began to fall into a state of self-hypnosis. Self and she identified or uncovered the very uh, reason for our, her unconscious uh, uh, fear of drinking liquids. She had seen a dog drink from a glass one time, and the very sight of this dog drinking from a glass, which is something you, usually people would drink from, right? The very sight of this was extremely repulsive to her. And so she had an aversion to drinking liquids ever since. Somehow or another she had internalized that, but unconsciously. And so she had found her own deeply seated and repressed reason for her neurosis. 
and was cured in a sense once this became obvious what was driving this fear or you know this kind of phobia that she had and so she's the one that gave this whole cure the name the talking cure and so ever since psycho psychoanalysis has been somewhat called the talking cure the idea is that through uh, free association uh, freely associating ideas um, a person is able to connect and get back to the rationale that is driving their fears, their phobias, their neurosis, their neurotic uh, behaviors, and so forth and so on. But this led Freud to seek a way to uncover repressed fears and desires and to uncover the two engines that he held that were driving the psyche and causing so much anxiety and uh, nervousness. And this led him to the book, The Interpretation of Dreams, or to the ideas in the book. Published in 1900, Freud's masterpiece of psychology signals the beginning of the psychoanalytic school. It was conceived with Brewer uh, and Anna O, oh, uh, but with interpretation, psychoanalytic thought is fully born. 31 years later, Freud would say, quote, it contains, even according to my present day judgment, the most valuable of all discoveries it has been my good fortune to make. Insight such as this falls to one's lot but once in a lifetime. So what was his discovery? How did it become the cornerstone of this new school of psychology, psychoanalysis? Well, he says that dreams are a royal road to the unconscious. He kind of gave up using hypnosis and he found what he felt was a better tool and that's dreams that dreams are kind of like an open window into our soul, if you will. <clears throat> so during a very difficult period in his mid-30s, he began to struggle to survive professionally, and his, his whole practice went through a, a great decline, in part because many of his ideas were so unpopular. But Freud began to analyze his own dreams and to try to use them as a path to un uncovering uh, hidden and secret places of the heart and the soul. And he found that these dreams could uncover unconscious drives and unconscious uh, struggles uh, between the id and the superego, okay? And so, if dreams are the path to reach our unconsciousness, why should we care? Why should we pay attention? Well, in the unconscious, a concept that Freud pioneers himself, the whole idea of an unconscious state of the human mind is a Freudian idea. So when we refer to the unconscious, we are essentially using a Freudian concept. Um, and so he says that we unwittingly hide deep desires and drives that persistently gnaw at us in our conscious life, but we are constantly suppressing them. We're repressing them and kind of sweeping them under the rug, so to speak. And then when you go to sleep, they can they kind of come out and this is why you have so many bizarre dreams and the dreams are revelatory they're symbols in the dreams of these struggles so freud discovers in his own dreams a body of repressed wishes uh, his many discoveries were so shocking that he became a pariah in the medical world of course this oedipus complex and these other things are uh, something that earned him no favor and no uh, kind of accolades at all. It was especially his work on the repressed sexual drive that, uh, that drives many people into neurosis that gained him the infamous reputation. So he does something that he calls dream work. Freud discovers that the dreams are like kind of digging up artifacts from the depths of the soul and they reveal hidden insights into our psychic makeup. So just as you could go out and do archeology span somewhere in a, a site and dig up artifacts and, fi and find things out about some previous uh, 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 settlers or civilization or city or something of that nature, we too do an archeology span into our own soul and we can uncover events such as Anna O oh, uncovering the event about when she was a child seeing the dog drink from the glass. So uh, dream work <clears throat> had long intrigued Freud and he grew up admiring Joseph, the interpreter of dreams in Genesis. 
And so Freud will see himself kind of as becoming like a modern day Joseph, someone who interprets dreams. Now, at that day and time, many people interpreted dreams in a kind of mechanical fashion. So he rejects the old theories of dream interpretation based upon fixed meanings and symbols. Such theorists even had kind of like dictionaries of symbols. And so a dream interpreter might say, well, well you dreamed of a lion. Well, okay, well that means that you want power. Um, you dream of flying or falling. Uh, well, there's a fixed meaning for that symbol too. Uh, you dreamed of water or a flood. Well, then that means this. You get the idea. Every, everything that a person would dream of in this view, this old view of dreams, had a fixed meaning for everyone. Freud rejects this because not every symbol means the same thing to every person. Okay? If I dream of a lion, that might be, mean something very different from your dreaming of a lion. Okay? And so Freud discovered that dreams are unique to each, each individual, but he held that there is an interpretive key to all dreams, and this is an interpretive principle. He said that when we sleep, the id kind of comes out of its imprisoned state. It gets to kind of come out of the bottle in a sense, uh, come out of its prison that, that has been created by the superego. All day long the superego, your conscience, uh, rules over the id and keeps it uh, pressed down and keeps it tamped down because if you let the id come out, well then you would become a social pariah, you would be rejected, you would be somehow or another ostracized, which human beings hate, or you would feel guilty, so you constantly keep the id bottled up. So when you, when you go to sleep, he says the id can kind of come out. And so we dream of things that we don't do. We dream of things that we can't do. And thus dreams disguise some desire or wish that we would like to fulfill. And so this is the basic interpretive key. All dreams are a wish fulfillment of an infantile sexual or violent urge of the id. Freud states, quote, if we adopt the method of interpreting dreams, which I have indicated here, we shall find that dreams really have a meaning and are far from being the expression of a fragmentary activity of the brain. When the work of interpretation has been completed, we perceive that a dream is the fulfillment of a wish. So all dreams are wish fulfillment. And you might be wondering, well, I had a dream of a monster chasing me. Uh, some hideous creature or something, and my feet were like, like uh, in glued to the ground and I could not run and it was coming after me. How is that a wish fulfillment? Freud goes through all kinds of scenarios like this. I mean, he's talked to many, many people and done a lot of research in their dreams. The idea is that you wish to get away. There is a wish to escape something that is after you. Now, what the monster represents well, that's something you have to figure out. If it was a lion that is after you, what does that represent? Is there something in your life that you would like to, you wish to escape? Okay, that's kind of the way it works here. So he sees all dreams as wish fulfillments. But the wish uh, gets repressed when we are awake and we're conscious. Why? Well, because it's not a civil wish. It's not something that you can admit to yourself even. It's taboo, it's forbidden, it's something that you banish from your thoughts the instant it pops up, especially in the realm of sex and violence. Our superego, the better part of our nature, our conscience, constantly banishes these thoughts when they arise. But in our sleep, again, these repressed drives emerge in a symbolic form and play out. Sometimes we remember them, but not always. If we can recall them, he says, the psychoanalyst's goal is to help someone through free association of images and symbols in our dream uh, to find their deep meaning. And the hope is to discover and dispel the nervous behaviors that are generated by these repressed drives. So that's the upshot of interpretation of dreams. A lot of what's in the book, though, are cases, looking at particular cases, looking at you know, here's a particular person who had this dream and then unpacking it and so forth and so on. And so he takes you through a lot of case studies in, in the book, but that's the upshot of the theory there, okay? And so psychoanalysis is this talking cure and especially about what kind of dreams one had and finding doing this deep dream work.